Hey there, I am Cameron Liner. I am currently enrolled in the CYB 5998 capstone program. Uh, during this program, I have been studying control systems and looking at the many ways in which today they are connected to one another and the risk mitigations uh, to those things. So I'm going to be talking more about that um, today. So as part of the capstone program, this is my second to last class in the Information Assurance and Cybersecurity Master's Program at Florida Institute of Techno Technology. Uh, this particular semester, all of my work has been under the guidance of uh, Dr. William, William Allen. I appreciate him uh, for all his help. Uh, so a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. Tell you a little bit about myself. I'm going to be talking about what industrial control systems actually are, um, why security is important when we're talking about an ICS, uh, the common threats that um, uh, are vulnerabilities that are associated with them, and the ways that we can mitigate them. And, and kind of the, the primary things that I saw as I did my research is there's, there's four main areas. There's uh, the people, the processes, the technology, and the design that goes into development of an ICS all play a key role in, in providing a secure system. And then I'll kind of sum things up at the, at the end. So a little bit about me. I uh, currently work at the Arnold Engineering Development Complex, which is an Air Force-owned uh, research, development, and testing facility. Uh, basically, anything that's been put into the air in the last 60 years has gone through Arnold Engineering Development Complex, uh, be it uh, turbine engines, missiles, rocket motors, uh, aerodynamic uh, models, uh, winglets, just about anything that goes in the air has been through us. Uh, down through uh, on this slide, I have some pictures of some of the assets that I uh, work on personally. And uh, the, the far left one is the Air Propulsion Systems Test Facility, uh, which is used for uh, turbine engine facilities, and it's, that's the exhaust plant. And uh, the second picture in the center there is the 16S, which is a 16-foot supersonic uh, test facility, closed-loop test facility for aerodynamic models. And the third one is the SL3 sea level test stand, um, where we test turbine engines at, at sea level. To make all of that happen takes giant industrial control systems, some of the largest power uh, draining motors in the world. We actually have uh, the same power feed as uh, the city of Chattanooga, which is one of the larger cities in, in Tennessee. Um, on any given day, uh, we, uh, we draw between two and 300 megawatts of power. Uh, so we're, we're feeding off of industrial control systems around us and the classic ones that you may consider, I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second, but SCADA systems that provide us power and then we take that and use industrial control systems to do process control uh, to feed environmental effects to the engines and missiles and rockets and those things, make them feel like they're up in the air, right? Um, this is critical infrastructure for us. And so we'll talk about uh, some more about ICSs, right? So generally you can place industrial control systems into three main categories. You have the uh, supervisor control um, and data acquisition systems or SCADA systems. Those You'll primarily find those in power control facilities, water treatment plants, large uh, citywide type control systems is generally where you find those. And then you have distributed control systems. The the idea behind a DCS is that you have centralized computing but distributed control with many, many fail, failure, uh, uh, failure and redundancy points within the system so that I can lose any piece of that system and the process continues. Generally, you'll find those in, in manufacturing facilities, especially like chemical processing plants, anywhere where they're producing widgets or a liquid or, or something, medicine, medical facilities, and producing something at a high rate and uh, a failure of that line is just unacceptable. You'll, you'll see DCSs. And then you have PLCs or uh, programmable logic controllers. Another term, which I didn't put on here, is a programmable automation controller, uh, which is just a new term that, that some of the manufacturers are starting to use. 
and you'll find those we we primarily use PLCs at AEDC uh, you'll probably find those in large process control facilities moving large machinery turning on and off systems constantly um, where it's not a uh, a straight flow of manufacturing process but that I'm modifying the system I'm reconfiguring it on the fly uh, multiple times per day to, to meet whatever test objective we have so PLCs fall with it uh, within my shop there's uh, one thing I will say before I move on is that there's been lots of research that has been done in the SCADA realm, but not nearly as much that's been done in the PLC and DCS area. I'm, I'm primarily going to be focusing on PLC uh, type control systems since that's what um, is most applicable to my, to my work. So what we find is no matter which of those systems we're talking about, they are increasingly more connected. Uh, what we have is business management type personnel and in, in, in management uh, personnel want to know the state of the facility. Am I running today? Am I running effectively today? Did I make schedule that I was wanting to meet, right? So did I actually get air on or did I get the process running at the time that I told my customer I would get running? They want to have that data. Um, they could wait, of course, and, and talk to plant control personnel and those things, but why do that when the data is there? And networks are easy, right? We can, we can just connect these things together. The other thing we see is uh, uptime is very important. So allowing a maintainer to get access to the system remotely, um, even if it might be on site, but that they don't have to go out and get in a truck and drive out to the facility to, to do some work. That's of course going to allow them to, to easily access, to do troubleshooting, get diagnostic data. Uh, they may be, even be able to repair the issue uh, from that remote location if it's a simple PLC fault or something that they can reset from their laptop wherever they're at. But the, the issue is is these increase the security threat to the system, right? So any vulnerability that I'm going to uh, that is discussed is really made worse or introduces even new vulnerabilities in the fact that it's now connected to something else. So the common threats uh, that are out there, I'll introduce this figure. The Department of Homeland Security, especially in the skate world, has really uh, asked for a lot of studies to be done, right? So you've got NIST and ISA and all these different uh, standards bodies out there uh, that are doing research at the request of the Homeland Security uh, to, to understand more about the risks and mitigations that we can put in place. They're very applicable to uh, all ICS systems. Software vulnerabilities are a huge, huge issue. So what you'll find is control systems are made up mostly of COTS or commercial off-the-shelf purchased components and software. So the human machine interfaces or HMIs are generally uh, using customized or at least configured COTS software. Uh, what you'll find is, as, and is a recurring theme as I talk about ICS is, is the name of the game is efficiency and getting the job done, right? And so this, what you'll find is they're not necessarily written in a way where they were looking at all the possible ways that somebody might attack this because historically these have always been on isolated control systems, right? So isolated networks that have no external connectivity. What are the chances somebody's going to get on within their gates into the building that's behind a locked door and be able to get in there anyway? What are they doing in there? And so there's just not a lot of emphasis that's placed on securing that system. But the same things that can uh, be vulnerabilities in software on the web or anywhere like, uh, like that can be an issue on an ICS. So we have improper input validation is a problem, right? So um, if, I'm, if I don't do proper input validation and I'm supposed to be able to input a temperature between 10 and 100 degrees, but I accidentally fat finger in 1000, right? So it may not be a malicious intent, but without improper input validation, I put in 1000 degrees my system may be capable of that from a burner perspective, but that may cause tons of problems down the line. It's very important that software vulnerabilities be kept in check. Credentials management, understanding who should have access to what, being able to 
uh, verify that a person is who they're saying they are, right, through tokens, uh, two-factor authentication, uh, and, and proper auditing of those things. Uh, we're talking about network design weaknesses, right? So it's real easy to just keep hanging switches and propagate the network to places. But, you know, are we doing things like using 802.1x or firewalls or uh, IDSs, intrusion detection systems, to protect our network? Uh, bad configuration management, right? So it's much easier for me to just get the job done, make the change, and get back out, let people go on and do their job. But if we don't keep up with our documentation and aren't disciplined to keep up with that documentation, then we completely lose sight of the actual configuration of that asset. Um, what we can find is we, we're not able to identify the vulnerabilities because we don't have a good ass, a good understanding of what the system really looks like. And secondly, if I have a disaster uh, that, that occurs, right, it could be a, a physical disaster or a virus does happen to make it into my system, then how am I really going to know how to put it back like it was if I don't know how it was, right? So I have to be able to do config good configuration control. Um, I have weak firewall rules, access control weaknesses, right? So I'm allowing people in that really shouldn't have access or I'm placing terminals and locations where it's easy for just someone to walk up to it, right? So access control. Um, increasingly, wireless is, is coming into play. Um, uh, one, one of the main reasons I've seen that is one, allowing technicians to roam about the, uh, the control system or the plant area and be able to get to get on the network and be able to do what they need to do. And secondly, it is very expensive to run wires to all of the instrumentation uh, that is gathering all this sensor data um, that I'm using for feedback in my control system. So wireless heart transmitters and wireless Profinet transmitters are out there now where I can place them up in a really hard to reach location uh, and then they transmit um, back that data uh, to, to some node that I have out there. And then a lack of automated detection tools, right? So that kind of goes back to network design, but that's saying that, hey, there are tools out there uh, that can help me or help alert me to the fact that something bad is happening. Okay, so the first thing we want to look at is mitigating through people. And uh, people are probably the most important thing that we can work on in order to secure the system, right? So if the people don't take security of the ICS seriously, then just about anything else we do is not going to help, right? They're going to look for ways to work around the processes, the technology, and the designs that we put in place to secure the system in the name of trying to get the job done, right? And so there's plenty of studies out there that tell us that we understand, we, we in the IT field understand the security requirements because industrial control systems are really just made up of more IT equipment, right? Some of it's specialized, but it's just IT equipment. Uh, so we understand what we should do, but because there's so much stress put on being efficient, not doing anything that would at all impact operations, we just kind of bend the rules a little bit, or we just say we're probably going to be okay. It skews our, it skews our uh, thoughts on risk because we're so operationally focused, right? So what we want to see is, is that leadership needs to have, take security seriously, whether it be on the business network or on the control system network. They, they need to take that seriously. They're going to generate processes and procedures that guarantee that those things happen, and they're going to instill a sense of seriousness, the seriousness for security within the people that work for them. Um, the other aspect is training. So you can instill all this, uh, you know, this belief that security is important, but if you don't train people on what it takes to have a secure system, that's not going to help either. And so there's there's actually training programs and certification programs out there. So ISA has a great cybersecurity certificate program uh, that you can send uh, people off to. And what's great about that particular program is it's kind of multi-level. And so you know, are these designers of systems? Uh, or are they maintainers of systems, or are they just operators, right? Each one of those needs to understand security, but the level of security, uh, you know, the ability to, to apply it or the ability to design systems that are secure, maybe the design part, right, doesn't apply to everybody. So they'll skip those things. 
processes. So processes and procedures, or you could even dive deeper into work instructions and, and, and those type of documents, define the business practices that are used. So what we want to see is with that management overhead saying, hey, security serious, we're going to document the processes that we use to keep those systems secure. Um, configuration management, we're going to have great configuration management. And here's the processes that you go through, right? So anytime that you move an asset, we're going to document that it's moved. Anytime you field new code, we're going to document uh, we're going to baseline that code in some version repository version control system and we're going to document the version that's installed in the field anytime that i need to make a modification to firewall rules i'm going to document that and vault the config for those firewalls so that i can get that back and i understand uh, why i made that change those are the things patch management right so I, I personally know from experience that there's you will get pushback if you say, hey, Microsoft released a patch. I need to it's a critical vulnerability on the system. I need to go patch it. And they're saying, but I'm running today and or um, I'm running for a month solid. You got to be able to come in there and say security is important. It's a critical vulnerability. We got to take a time out and install this. Uh, and I've done everything I can do, right? So I've, I've installed it in a lab, I've checked it out, I've made sure that I'm 99.9% .9 sure that this thing is gonna work out of the gate, but I'm, we gotta be willing to take the risk and go ahead and install it in the field. Um, I've already talked about code development. Audit, auditing, um, you know, is a big deal, especially if the system is isolated and not connected, getting the administrators out there to do their auditing is super important. And we also want to baseline, have, have an understanding of what the baseline configuration of the system is. We're going to install virus scanners, right? We're going to implement some security settings. So in the DOD world, we have STIGs, uh, secure, security technical implementation guides. Uh, that tell us the secure way to uh, configure the system. We're going to do that. That is the baseline that we build our system off of. Once we have the processes in place, we got to look at the technologies that are used. Uh, so there are some special protocols that are really designed from the ground up for industrial control systems. They're not designed to be secure necessarily, but they're designed to allow real-time communication um, for sensor data and instrumentation, data collection, HMI um, uh, update information, those that kind of information to be passed on a network, right? Uh, so three, three types uh, that are out there are Profinet, Modbus, and Heart. Those are just three among many that have been uh, designed over the years. Genius Bus, Field Bus, I could, you know, I could go on and on. But they're special protocols specifically for ICSs. So, but the good news is, is that standard network security devices can be used. They just have to be tuned to understand these protocols. So an intrusion detection system out of the box is going to understand web traffic, FTP, SSH traffic. It's going to under, understand, uh, you know, LDAP for directories. It's going to understand those things and be able to quickly identify those, color code them, give you pretty charts about that. It's not going to know what a Profinet network looks like. But it can be tuned to do that. It can be tuned to notice it. It can be tuned to monitor, especially for anomaly-based IDSs. It can be tuned to monitor that traffic for what does it normally look like and then alert you if it sees, hey, there's been a new device added that wasn't here before or, man, there seems to be a whole lot more chatter in the Profinet arena than there was yesterday um, and alert you to the fact that there's something different, right? And uh, I won't go into that too much, but you can uh, you can configure them to automate it, alert you, automatically take action, all those things. So we want to use these tools to our advantage that are out there. I, I already mentioned it, one of, the, one of the things we want to look at or remember is that these were built for operational effectiveness, not necessarily for security. Profinet's a good example because there's a uh, technology called ProfiSafe that is built within Profinet. And that can be misunderstood. You go, well, it's safe, right? So it's, but it's, it's not safe from a security perspective. It's safe from an operational perspective. And so what they've done is uh, built into the system the ability to have redundant modules, to be able to quickly uh, pull modules and put new modules in and, uh, and, and operate in safe conditions, right? So it, it redu reduces the total failure modes in the system. 
there is a add-on or um, a technology that's put on top of Profinet, which are called the security modules. And really what a security module does is it encrypts the traffic between two Profinet nodes. So that's a good thing because it means that this normally clear text information that's passing over the network is now encrypted. And so if someone tries to do like a man in the middle, then they're going to have a much more difficult time trying to understand that traffic flow and do replays and all those things. The bad news there, though, is Profinet was built to be an open standard. So I can use GE, Allen Bradley, Siemens, whatever PLC I want. As long as they talk pre uh, Profinet, we're fine. Well, the, the add-on security modules are vendor-specific, so I'm going to get vendor lock-in. But that may be a trade that we're willing to make in order to secure the system. So technology, so we continue on that. Another one I'd like to talk about are data diodes. And there's lots of information out there on them, but just a real quick summary of what a data diode is. It is a certified device. Uh, there's many manufacturers out there, BAE systems, the OWL ones. Uh, but anyway, there, there's systems out there and they're certified one-way transmission devices. Why would I ever want to use that? Well, if I do say that I need to connect my industrial control system to a business network or to some external network, uh, then I'm going to be much safer if I can guarantee that data is going to leave my ICS to go to whatever network it is, but there is no way that data is going to come back. It is a physical device that guarantees one-way communication, unlike a firewall, which is configured. It can be misconfigured, it can be hacked because it's running an operating system and we all know that you know there's got there's always going to be some way, some vulnerability that I've not uncovered that an attacker could most likely exploit if, uh, at some point, right? But this is a physical device, there's no way they're getting back through this device. And so I can I can use these. Generally these are uh, are used in especially in DOD classification, setting up, you know, tests and those things. They're they're generally used when I have a system of a lower classification, so an unclassified system potentially, that is sending data into a classified system. And I need data from that lower classification system to do something that I need to do in the higher classification system. So I know that data can go in, but data is not coming back out, right? So I do not have a risk to that lower of spillage from that higher to the lower classification. It's, it's now mitigated uh, through that. So the, the next one and the last one is the mitigation through design. And what we want to do is to architect our networks so that we are opening up the least amount of vulnerability, right? So we've already determined connectivity is, or at least I should say that differently, that transfer of data is required. But there's some questions we ought to ask ourselves before we just go plugging wires together. Uh, does the information exchange need to be real time? Uh, so, you know, milliseconds matter. Uh, does it need to be real time? Does the information exchange need to be bi-directional, two-way? Uh, and what are the types of data that I need to exchange? So the first one, if we can answer no to, you know, real time is not really the thing. I just need to be able to get data back and forth between my ICS and my, and my business network is what I'm showing here. Uh, then the sneaker net or manual transfer method is going to be just fine, right? So I can log data within the ICS at the end of a shift or end of operations, whatever that is, I can put that on an external USB hard drive and carry hand carry that over to a business system. I'm gonna have pro I'm gonna have those processes and policies in place, right? That say that I'm gonna I'm gonna virus scan that data. I'm gonna you know I'm gonna have steps that I'm gonna take uh, and to move that over to the business network. And if I need to move data back, I go through that same process. I'm going to scan it, make sure everything's okay, and introduce that data back into my ICS. But what if real time is required? Well, then we have a few options and we need to answer some more questions. So what if the information does not actually need to be bidirectional? Well, that takes us back to the data diode discussion I was having, right? I can send data over there in real time uh, and to the business network and be uh, safe and sound, not knowing that no data is going to come back the other way. Okay, but I do need bidirectional data. 
Well, then we have to ask, what kind of data is it? If it's streaming data, so it's uh, bits and bytes going across, but it's not file-based, it's streaming data, then we can actually double to a two-diode configuration. And so why would I, why would I ever want to do this, right? So it's not, a, again, it's not a firewall. And because data diodes only work in one way, uh, communication, they, they don't transfer TCP IP, right? It's UDP only. So if someone were to try, and it's also very port, it's port specific and traffic specific. These things are, um, uh, it's actually very difficult to get data through a data diode. You have to set up everything exactly perfectly. And so an attacker is gonna have to understand exactly what you're sending, the data you're sending, the port you're using, all those things. They're gonna have to understand that to get something through that you weren't specifically allowing. Uh, so uh, so it, it increases the security of the system. Uh, by using a uh, kind of unorthodox method of two-way communication, if you will. Okay, and the last one is, if I'm doing file-based transfers, while it is possible to do file-based transfers through a data diode, you really want to con start considering a dual firewall configuration. So why would I want a dual firewall uh, a a configuration here? So the business system network has its own firewall. Right, that it's protecting itself from the internet or maybe other business uh, businesses that are connected in, other external customers that are connected in, it's protecting itself. I need another firewall between the business system and my control system, right? So to me, as an industrial control system engineer, that is the Wild West to me. It's just as bad as connecting directly to the internet. Although I'm sure they're doing a good job of maintaining security on the business system, I don't trust them. And so I'm going to have a firewall that I have control over. I'm going to talk to those guys to understand what rules that they need uh, set up to be able to transfer and receive data from me. But I'm going to be uh, very cautious. I'm going to be default deny and open up things as little as possible until I'm able to receive the data that I need. And then I'm going to try to start closing it back up again until until I, you know, lose it and then back it up a little bit more, right? I'm going to be just extremely cautious uh, when I go down this, world, uh, down this route. And the main reason, as I mentioned before, is firewalls run an operating system. Firewalls can be attacked. Firewalls, an attacker can get through into the business network. I'm giving them something that they're probably familiar with, firewalls, that they can sit there and attack uh, to get through. All right, so just in conclusion, looking back through all that is ICS is industrial control systems are, are vital infrastructure, critical infrastructure to many businesses, manufacturing facilities, process control facilities, chemical plants, you know, power grids, all those things. ICSs are extremely important. There's business loss. You can have damage to machinery if something were to happen. And in worst case scenario, you can hurt people um, if, if someone were to attack an ICS, even if it's just uh, taking it offline. People can be hurt. Uh, systems are these systems are becoming increasingly connected, and so it's important for us to take security seriously. We understand IT security. Uh, you know, many, many books and, uh, and studies are out there about IT security. It's it's a hot topic. We get it, but um, within an ICS, we tend to look at operational effectiveness first. And we really got to switch that around and look at security first and then how can we effectively operate with a secure system. Um, and, and in looking at how we can secure a system, we really have to look at all aspects. And so I covered the people, the processes, the technology, and the designs that we put in place. So I just appreciate uh, being able to perform this project. Uh, this capstone effort uh, was was enlightening to me as a manager of an a very large industrial control system. It was enlightening to me. This is going to benefit me uh, tremendously and my team. I've already started 
to implement some of these practices. Um, something I did not discuss uh, during the previous slides was future work. I, I think there could be plenty of work done in secure development of software for ICSs. It could be a paper on its, on its own. Uh, but I really do just appreciate the ability to work on this. I appreciate Dr. Allen and, and helping me find sources and uh, reviewing this paper along the way. Thank you.